forget if we don't. Yes, we did it. <laughs> um, so we are very happy that everybody uh, is here. Uh, we are very happy with how this year uh, went in terms of seminars. Uh, we are thinking about how we're going to do that next year, if we're going to keep the same day, the same time. Uh, we had a different number of formats. We had long talks, short talks, lightning talks. So probably we're going to keep varying uh, just to keep things more dynamic. Um, but we will definitely let you know uh, more details next year. So the first talk today is by Geoffrey Finch. Uh, and after that, we're going to have a, a little thing that we prepared uh, with your help. So I hope everybody likes that. Um, so Geoffrey is a PhD student at, at University of Arizona Tucson uh, with Mike Barker, who is here today. Thank, thank you all for coming. Um, and Geoffrey is working with uh, the subtribe Marcantirini in Asteri. And his main interest is in chromosome number evolution, especially plants with low numbers of chromosomes. So he's going to talk about chromosomes uh, today. And I hope you all enjoy. So uh, you can start whenever you want, Geoffrey. Oh yeah, and please keep your mics off uh, during the talk. And if you have any questions, you can put that on the chat. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Carol, for that uh, introduction. Let's see. All right. So hi, everybody. My name is Jeff. Um, as Carol mentioned, I. I'm a third year PhD student at U of A in the Barker Lab, and today I'm going to be talking about chromosome number evolution in the Macaranthereni, um, which is a subtype in the Asteri. <clears throat> so, this is a figure from Roman Palacios et al. that shows the my pointer going that shows the distribution of haploid chromosome numbers in three major clades of eukaryotes, ferns, animals, and angiosperms. Um, and we see this striking pattern that animals and angiosperms have shared this similar distribution where um, the vast majority of species are centered around these numbers of uh, 9 to 12, right? Uh, but in contrast to that, the Macaranthereni have are entirely centered around, well, the, the vast majority of species in this subtribe have chromosome numbers around six, five, and four. So they are um, unusually low for angiosperms. For example, um, there are three genera with uh, base numbers of four, such as uh, the dieteria. Um, I think five genera with base numbers of five, such as Arida. Uh, and then a handful of four, I think, genera with base numbers of six, such as isocoma. Um, and this also includes the uh, Grindelia, which is the largest genus in the group. <clears throat> and then there is also a, a, a species that's very special to my heart uh, that has the lowest chromosome number that's been documented in angiosperms, which is two, and that is Xanthisma gracile. I won't be talking too much about this plant today, but it's it's become the the focal uh, plant, uh, focal research interest um, for me in my PhD work. Um, but today I'm going to be talking about chromosome number distribution in the subtribe as a whole and drivers of that distribution. So the tribe Asteri is hypothesized to have a base chromosome number of nine. And it was discovered early on that the tribe has this bimodal distribution uh, in chromosome numbers. So not surprisingly, the majority of species have chromosome numbers around nine, as you can see here with this peak. But then we also have this uh, sort of secondary hump around four, five, and six. And this is where the Macaranthereni falls, right? Um, and, and even from the time of this study, it was inferred that nine is the ancestral chromosome number for the group and that these lower numbers are derived from that. And so the macaranthereni seem to be an excellent example of this process. 
uh, the, the most closely related uh, species are the Eurybioid asters. This is a, a grade of four genera, uh, Eurybia, Oreostema, Ericea, and uh, Trinit Eurybia, all with base numbers of nine. Whereas the, the more derived Macaranthirini have base numbers around six, five, and four, as I just said. And there are some other qualitative differences as well. The Eurybioids are, are more perennial and uh, more concentrated in mesic habitats, as represented by these little cartoons. Um, whereas the Macaranthirini have a high number of annual species and are more concentrated in xeric habitats, such as the, the deserts um, here in Arizona. And so the primary question that I'm going to be focusing on today is whether uh, at some point during the origin and radiation of the Macaranthirini, the lineage experienced a, a sort of rapid acceleration in the rate of chromosome loss. So we can see that, of course, at some point, we had to lose three chromosomes to get from nine to six and lower numbers. Uh, so the main question here is how, how rapidly did that occur? And um, was it perhaps more rapid than, than normal, more rapid than, than the average rates of evolution across the Asteraceae? So we take a phylogenetic approach to characterizing chromosome uh, evolution in this group with a, a couple of objectives. So we want to deduce the base chromosome number of the subtribe, um, determine the rates of descending and ascending dysploidy, as well as um, whole genome duplication, um, which I'll talk more about in a second. And then also determine when chromosome number reductions occurred uh, leading up to the origin of the subtribe, as well as within the subtribe. And so that's when in both in a phylogenetic sense and, and in geological terms. And we can accomplish this with chromoval. Uh, but before I get into what chromoval is and how it works, I just want to review a couple of key terms related to chromosome number change. So whole genome duplication, which I'll just refer to as uh, duplication going forward, is a, is a doubling of chromosome number, um, which also involves a doubling of gene content. So you might go, for example, from having six chromosomes to 12 chromosomes. Aneuploidy is a unit change in, in chromosome number that occurs through missegregation. So you gain or lose a single chromosome, and then the gene content of one chromosome is doubled or is halved. So there's, um, this, is, this is thought to be strongly selected against because of issues with um, gene dosage. Whereas dysploidy is a unit change in chromosome number that is not accompanied by a change in gene content. So uh, we can expect less negative selection against dysploid events. And we can have ascending dysploidy, or what I'm more focused on in this talk is descending dysploidy, which occurs, for example, through um, Robertsonian translocations or end-to-end -end fusions. And you can see that in these processes, um, the, the gene content of the smaller chromosomes is retained in the larger fused chromosomes. What's lost are things like telomeric repeats or um, centromeres, depending on the process. And so chromoval is the main tool that I'm going to use to quantify the rates at which these processes occur in, in the subtribe and its relatives. So this is a probabilistic framework for estimating these rates. And this figure here on the bottom left illustrates the types of chromosome number transitions that are allowed in the model. So we have ascending dysploidy plus one, descending dysploidy minus one, whole genome duplication times two. This here is uh, called demiduplication, and it represents an increase by a factor of 1.5. And then this rate on the left is not really going to come up um, in the rest of this talk, but this represents increases in some multiple C of the base number B of the, of the group under consideration. So 
when Chromoval, so Chromoval will estimate the rates of chromosome number transitions under several different models shown here. And then we can use the, uh, we use the AIC scores to determine which model best fits the data. So for example, um, M0, the first model is the simplest. It allows only two parameters, lambda for, for gains, delta for losses. Um, in the case of, in the case of my results, these specific analyses, the best fitting models are always going to be uh, M2 and M3. So these are models that have uh, a parameter for gains, losses, and then also duplication. In M2, this duplication parameter represents the rate of rates of polyploidy and demi-polyploidy, and they're constrained to be equal. Uh, whereas in M3, we now have a we introduce a separate rate for demi-polyploidy so that uh, it can be it can vary. It can be different from the rate of polyploidy. And then it's important to emphasize one uh, limitation of Kremlin, which is that it assumes that the rates the rates that it estimates are uniform across the tree. So if we determine a certain rate of descending dysploidy, say for a, a large tree, it's not possible to then determine um, whether a single branch or a small subtree is contributing disproportionately to that rate. So this, um, I'll come back to that more later. <clears throat> So what kind, of, what kind of rates can we expect to see? Um, this, this figure on the right is from a recent survey um, of rates of duplication and dysploidy across angiosperm families. So in this case, um, we're seeing the rates of duplication in the families with the highest rate and the families with the lowest rates um, you can see that the family with the highest rate is the POACI at 0.71 events per million years. Um, and then there are a few families with no evidence of duplication, at least uh, no evidence from Chromoval. That's not to say that no um, duplication has ever occurred, but the rates are very low. There is substantially more variation in the rates of dysploidy across uh, families in where um, the cyperaceae is going to have the highest rates of ascending and descending dysploidy. Um, and then there are many families that are estimated to have rates of zero. So again, my main focus, since I'm uh, largely focused on this group with very low numbers, is rates of descending dysploidy. We see about a 2,000 fold variation across families in this rate. Again, the highest the family with the highest rate is the Cyperaceae with about 2.76 events per million years. And then again, we have a large number of families with estimated rates of zero. So we have a lot of variation. Um, but so of course the, the family that's of most interest to us <laughs> is the Asteraceae. So um, again, these rates come from, from that same paper, John et al. And the asteraceae has a, a relatively high rate of descending dysploidy. It's, it's among the top um, 15 of the families, top 15 rates of the families that were estimated. Um, and it also has a, a moderately high rate of duplication. So this here is a, a sort of quick, rough uh, chromosome number distribution that I put together using chromosome counts from the chromosome count database, which is where all I, I got all of my counts for this talk. And you can see that, uh, as expected, the, the majority of species have numbers around nine, but we also have this large peak around 18, um, which we can imagine is fueled partly by this high rate of duplication. So we can imagine species uh, with numbers around nine are creating, experiencing whole genome duplications, creating species with 18. And then uh, a high rate of descending dysploidy will drive them back down to nine and uh, to even lower numbers, um, such as those found in the macaranthereni. So to 
reiterate the focus of my research, I want to know how the rates of chromosome number evolution in the macroantherini compared to these rates in the Asteraceae, as well as across angiosperms, and whether we see uh, an accelerated rate of descending dysplady in particular, accompanying the origin and radiation of the group. So the inputs to chromoval are um, a list of chromosome counts and a tree. So the tree that I used was constructed from ETS and ITS sequences uh, that I pulled from GenBank. They were aligned in pasta, um, assembled into a starting tree in RaxML. Then I dated the tree using RevBays, and then that tree was input into chromoval. So uh, dating the tree, taking this extra step of dating the tree allows us to determine the rates of dysplodia and, and duplication in terms of events per million years. Now, in order to get at the question of whether there was a sudden acceleration in the rate of descending dysplodia around here in the tree, I built a tree that included uh, the closest relatives of the macroantherini. So the tree includes the eurobioids as well as this, um, this subtribe that's sister to both of those groups, uh, the symphatricini. And then I ran this entire tree through chromoval to get the estimated rates for the whole group. And then I chopped it into subtrees to try to isolate uh, the relative contributions of each clade to those rates that are estimated for the entire tree. So I, I re-ran chromoval on the, the tree having pruned out the macroantherini and then uh, did the same thing having pruned out the symphatricini and the eurybioids. And so the expectation here is that on this tree, this last tree, we should see the highest rate of descending dysplody of any of the trees. This is the phylogeny that I built. This is, um, again, this was time calibrated using uh, RevBase, using the priors and a RevBase script adapted from Schneider and Moore, which is a study of um, where they studied the amphitropical distribution of the Grindelia. So I took that script and I added um, several taxa from the Eurybioids and the Symphatricini, as well as uh, two species of Mutissia which represents a very early diverging lineage of the in the Asteraceae. And the reason that I added that um, was so that I could use um, this fossil, Raiguen Raiyun Kura, hopefully I pronounced that right, um, to calibrate the uh, age of the root of the tree. This was necessary because there are no fossils for the Asteraceae. So um, this is a very, it's not ideal, it's a very ancient node to be calibrating. Um, but it was the node for which a, a fossil was available. Um, and the result of this analysis is uh, an, a, the origin of the macroantherini is estimated to be about 3.17 million years ago. Um, so during the mid to late Pliocene. And this red arrow shows the uh, most recent common ancestor of the subtribe. Okay, so when I ran that, this whole tree, the full tree through chromoval, these are the results that I get. Um, well, when I say whole tree, I, I actually pruned off the, the Mutissia species. And so this little outgroup that's left is uh, two species of Boltonia and uh, Chloracantha. And so I set the root frequency to nine, and we get a pretty high rate of descending dysploidy at 0.1 and moderately high rates of duplication and demi-duplication as well. And again, these, are in, these rates are in events per million years. So this, the best fitting model is constant rate demi, meaning that these two rates are constrained to be equal to each other. The base chromosome number of the macroantherini is estimated with a pretty high posterior probability to be six, which is expected. Um, but then interestingly, these uh, other internal nodes leading to the eurybioids 
are also estimated with a high probability to be um, six to have an ancestral state of, of n equals six. Um, and I say that's surprising because the base numbers of each of these genera is nine or a polyploid derivative of nine. So I think that this is attributable to the fact that I mentioned before, which is that the rates that Chromoval is estimating are uh, assumed to be equal across the entire tree. So in order to explain the high frequency of species with low chromosome numbers, in the macroantherony and the symphyotrichini, um, which also has several species with five chromosomes. Uh, Chromoval estimates a rate, uh, a relatively high rate of descending dyspoidy, which then makes it um, quite probable that uh, the chromosome numbers were already down to six um, as early on as this node here. <clears throat> So what happens if I prune off the macroantherony and rerun the rerun chrome of all? Um, so first of all, the rates of the rate of ascending dysploidy and the rates of duplication and demiduplication go up, um, while the rate of descending dysploidy goes down, somewhat somewhat significantly. So it was, it was about 0.1 on the full tree, and now it's down to 0.074. Uh, so it does seem as though descending dysploidy is slower uh, when we only consider these two uh, subclades, subgroups. Um, and now the ancestral states of these internal nodes leading to the eurybioids are estimated with a high probability to be nine, which uh, is more expected in my opinion, given the distribution of counts within these genera. Um, however, the it's still kind of uh, uncertain about the ancestral states at this node and at the origin of the symphyotrichini. So it's about a 50-50 split between six and nine um, here at this internal node. And then uh, is estimating a, a base number of six for the symphyotrichini. This uh, I think is worthy of future research. It's not the focus of my research, uh, but I think that chromosome number in this group is highly variable, and I, I don't think that this is a particularly good sampling of the, all, all of the tax involved. So um, I think there's, there's work to be done to improve these estimates. Um, and then, so what happens when I, when I prune off the symphyotrichini and the eurybioids and just run it on the, our focal group of the macroantherony? Now we see a pretty large jump in the rate of descending dyspoidy. As ascending dyspoidy falls to uh, almost zero, and um, the rates of duplication and demiduplication are lower as well. So this is the one this is the one tree for which the constant rate demi est model is the most is the best fitting, which means uh, these two rates are now allowed to vary from each other. But so this this is what we were expecting, assuming that there's some sort of uh, increased rate of descending dyspoidy leading to and within the macroantherony. Then I've added these orange arrows to indicate the estimated uh, locations of descending dyspoidy events. So we have three from the uh, root leading to the origin, of course, um, because the base number of the group is now estimated with a very high posterior probability to be six. And then within the group, we see several dysploidy events uh, leading up to the origins of uh, many of the many of the genera. Uh, so for example, um, we'll see several dysploid events leading to these n equal, x equal five genera, as well as in green, as well as the uh, x equal four genera, such as xanthisma, uh, shown in purple. And, and then there are a few uh, descending dysploidy events here closer to the tips that I am not showing just for um, clarity. Uh, the, most, the most obvious being uh, at the branch leading to xanthisma gracile, there would be two additional dis descending dysploidy events to create the n equal two cytotype. <clears throat> so are these rates remarkable? Um, 
they're not record breaking, but they are quite high. Uh, so these, this graph shows the same rates um, that I was showing earlier from the survey done by uh, Zhang et al. Um, except that I clipped out the Cyperaceae just to make the graph more readable because they would be off the, off the slide here. And you can see that, that rates in the macroanthony are uh, quite high. We're, th we're within the top uh, 16, I think, um, rates in this, um, among these estimates, where the uh, median rate is shown by this white dashed line here. This is the median rate for all families across Angeles Parks. Um, so it is quite high. And then down here at the bottom, we can see the, the rates from the tree with just the symphatric and the uroboids. Um, still pretty high, but um, not quite as, as remarkable as the macroanthony. But the rates in the subtribe are actually still a little bit lower than what was estimated for the Asteraceae as a whole. Um, and uh, again, I, I forgot to mention, this is, this is just focusing on the rates of uh, descending dysplasia in events per million years. So uh, what's going on? There. Well, I want to revisit this slide and, and just point out that the rate, the rate of descending dysploidy is indeed higher in the asteraceae, uh, but so is the rate of, of duplication. So the, <clears throat> the key takeaway from that is that the, the overall low chromosome numbers in this subtribe are not just the result of a high rate of descending dysploidy. That's coupled with low, low rates of duplication and a very, very low rate of um, ascending dysploidy. So that, that um, cocktail of, of effects is what, is what is really creating that lower distribution of chromosome numbers. Um, this group originated and, and radiated <laughs> during the uh, late Pliocene and uh, the Pleistocene epochs. Um, and we see several uh, descending dysploidy events during that time. And so going forward, um, we are going to try to improve this phylogeny, both by sampling new species, but also doing a little bit uh, deeper sequencing of, the, of species that are already sampled um, and providing new counts. So we can do a more exhaustive uh, analysis of rates of chromosome number evolution. Um, and we also want to develop, um, we also want to perform some kind of test for selection um, to determine whether these rates, these relatively high rates of, or this relatively high rate of descending dysploidy is, is actually associated with selection for reduced chromosome numbers, possibly associated with uh, their the association with xeric habitats and annual growth habit in the uh, subtribe. So uh, with that, I wanna um, thank everyone who has supported me um, in the Barker lab, in particular, Mike Barker, my advisor. Um, and of course the, the faculty and staff at, at the University of Arizona EEB department, oops. Uh, and with that, I will take any questions. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. That was uh, very cool. Uh, I realized that I murdered the name of the subtribe when I said it. Uh, <laughs> so it's Macarenterini, not Marcanterini. I I inverted the R. <laughs> um, I I mean I I don't think I've ever heard anyone else pronounce it. So I <laughs> I may. <be. laughs> I maybe no, just made it up myself. I, no, I really like I, I read it wrong. I think like some my brain like fizzled out on the position of the R and I was like reading it wrong all the time. <laughs> uh, yeah. So thank you very much. That was very interesting. I really enjoyed the uh, the uh, explanation of how Chrome Evolve work uh, works. I think it was very, very clarifying for every, for a lot of people. Uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, you can either put them on the chat or uh, just open your mics and uh, ask them. So uh, I think Jennifer has one, no? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, you see. 
Yeah, so you're asking about genome sizes and uh, structure, e.g. repeat content across the clade. Um, I, well, that, I could add that to um, the future directions slide um, is, to, is to more thoroughly characterize repeat content in particular um, and, and other aspects of genome structure. Uh, but we do know that within, the, within Xanthisma, for example, um, you, have, you have the ancestral N equal four populations. You also have N equal three populations and, and then the, the predominant N equal two population. And there isn't significant variation in genome size across those groups. So um, I, I don't know if I can generalize across the entire subtribe, um, but it's, it seems like uh, what is mainly going on here is dysploidy without major changes in genome size. OK, let's see. I, know, I see another question. Uh, did you mention how you plan to make new chromosome counts and estimating ploidy? Are you just doing squashes? Are you planning to submit the new count data to CCDB as well? Yes, uh, I have been slowly learning how to do chromosome squashes, uh, in particularly root tip squashes. Uh, so that is that is the plan going forward for any for any new counts that we do is to is to do root tip squashes or or meiotic squashes. And, and then uh, I will definitely be submitting those to the chromosome counts database. We have another question. Uh, so if you know uh, if chromoval can accommodate terminals with variable numbers, or does every terminal have to have only one number? Uh, it, yes, it can accommodate terminals with variable numbers. Um, your, and, I, I actually didn't include variable numbers in these analyses because you're meant to include the frequencies of the um, variable numbers as well. And I don't have accurate estimates of those frequencies. So um, I just use the median counts from the chromosome counts database. And Luis Palazzesi is just letting you know that there are some fossil records of the subfamily Asteroidae uh, that you can use to add more calibration points. And he can drop you an email with some papers. Sure, yeah, uh, that would be that would be great. Copy me in the email to Luis. I'm <laughs> curious about those papers. <laughs> I was, yeah, I was trying to use um, a calibration point in the in the I think the stem of the anthemidae, uh, but I was just my my rev based script just wasn't accepting it, so I I, pruned, I had to print that off. So you're using have rev based too? Uh, mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, yeah, I've been using that uh, for another project, not with us AC right now, uh, and it's it is a learning curve. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it took quite a while. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So anybody has more any more questions? Um, I'm I'm gonna go ahead and put my email address in the chat. Oh cool, yeah, thank you. Okay, if we don't have any more questions, then we can go to the second party, the second part of the uh, of the presentation. Thank you very much again uh, for presenting. That was a great talk. Uh, I think there's a lot that people can do with chromosomes in AC. I think there's still a lot to learn. <laughs> uh, so I hope that it stimulate, like, stimulates more people to, to work on that too. Okay, so now it's my turn to talk a lot more. So I've been requesting emails, uh, through email, uh, photos of AC, and uh, we've been on Twitter uh, asking people to send us photos of their favorite AC. And that's because we wanted to do something fun and cool for this last talk of the semester, of the year. And uh, we put together a little something uh, that we can show to everybody. Okay, so let's start. So I think everybody that, um, uh, that opened the Composited book has seen 
the faceplate of the book with this uh, is it epigraph, I forgot the name of this, uh, that is this phrase in Latin that is from a word from Lessing uh, that roughly translated to English means uh, I fell in great love with the composite family. And that's in one of his first monographs of the, of the composite that he did. Um, and I think everybody that works with plants or animals and organisms in general end up falling in love with their own study organism. But I always see people that work with, with composite being very, very passionate about uh, what they work with. So I wanted to showcase that passion and love that we have for those weird, crazy plants. Uh, so I was going to, uh, so I asked people to send uh, a photo of their favorite composite and a short a short uh, sentence saying why they love it so much. Uh, and I was going to read all of them, uh, but it ended up being like a lot of sub submissions. So I'm not, I'm just going to give people some time to read. I'm just going to summarize what they said. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to be here talking and I'm going to run out of voice. Oh, I have someone coming. Oops. Okay. So we got this beautiful photo from uh, Ari Mailius. Uh, sorry people if I don't say your name right. Uh, this is Hypocaris variegata and it's the plant that he that they use in their master thesis and they like the color combination of the corollas uh, and the contrast between between the apices that are um, pur purple and the white margins of the filary the filaries. Uh, it's a beautiful photo. Thank you for the submission. I'm gonna keep this slide a little bit so everybody can read. Okay, so uh, we got a Leontopodium alpinum, uh, which is the Edelweiss uh, from, from the Alps. Uh, I'm not gonna try to say the name in Serbian, I'm sorry. It's a very pretty plant. It has secondary heads. I don't know if anybody knows that. Uh, we got a very poetic sense, sentence, too young to be old. Very pretty plant. Going back, ah, sorry. <laughs> um, from Luis Lima Valente, we have a picture of Senecio Lamarquianus, uh, which is an endemic species to Mauritius, and it's a very rare species. Um, I'm glad you guys found it, uh, and I hope you managed to uh, protect the species from the uh, from any threats. It's a very interesting Senecio. So this one, I had to go really look if it was an Asteraceae because it looks so different to me. So it's Crementodium. I didn't know this genus. It's from the Sino-Himalayan region uh, from very high altitudes and in, in limestones. Uh, it's, this species is called Crematodium campanulatum, variety campanulatum, and it's from Southwestern China. Um, and the filaries, uh, attract pollinators too. It is a very elegant plant, I really like it. Uh, it's so weird how, how these plants uh, get so varied in shape. So this is a Centauria. Uh, it's, it's a different genus, it's a, in genus Raponticoides, Raponticoi but it used to be in Centauria. Um, it's an extremely narrow endemic from South Portugal. And it shares the, it has the same chloroplast sequence of the relatives of Centauria from the Arena Turanian region, which uh, probably is a very interesting biogeographical history in there. Um, it's a very, very pretty plant. So another uh, Centauria relative. Uh, this is a tiny annual from Turkey and Iran, uh, and it is the closest relative of the genus Psephas. I'm not going to try to say that. I'm sorry, people. <laughs> it's a very pretty plant, too. I like it. 
So this is a surprising one. So this is a sunflower. It's a very weird sunflower from the pine savannas uh, from the southern US. Uh, and Laura was explaining that they don't usually don't have the ray florets, uh, except sometimes when you cultivate them, they can develop some mutant rays. Um, and here you have a, a head without any ray florets. Uh, they're very interesting. Uh, probably they have a very interesting pollinator pollination biology too. And this population uh, in the back is being grow um, in in California. So very interesting sunflower. Okay, this is a great one too. So. This is called vegetable sheep. And this is a, a zoom of the, the heads of this plant. And this is the plant. Uh, so apparently they are uh, in tribe Senecioni, uh, which is very interesting. Like Senecioni can do all kinds of crazy things. Um, probably a very interesting plant to see in their natural habitat. OK, this is Bacaris aliena uh, with a big fly on it. This is a crazy looking fly. Uh, so Victoria liked this plants because it's the one of the first that she studied in detail, and she especially focused on the phenology. It's a very cute Bacaris. Uh, thank you for sending it. So this is uh, Invernoni, that's Heterocoma erecta. So Nadia sent this photo because uh, she likes, she, she was saying that the palias, which are these pink structures in the head, uh, they're thought to be uh, a protection against herbivory. Uh, but in this case, they're also pink colored. So uh, what is their actual function? So probably there's some interesting hypothesis about uh, reproduction in this, in this plants here. And also look at this trichomes, so hairy and fluffy. Okay, this is a beautiful Calia paraguayensis, paraguayensis uh, and shows this beautiful involucral bract with this uh, ribs. Uh, the colors are so pretty. And Vinicius said that the beauty can be under our eyes where we least expect. So just a reminder to sometimes flip over the flower when you're looking at it. There might be something interesting on the bottom. <laughs> and here we have a plant from Australia. So this is Leucochrysum albicans, uh, also known as, known as the hoary sun ray. Um, it's a relatively relatively rare in Australia and has a national recovery plant. Uh, Canberra is one of the places where it's found uh, and it covers the ground whenever there's good in winter rains. Uh, it has this dark red and yellow and white colors uh, and that's why it's called tricolor. And uh, here's the photo of the habitat with them gro growing on the sides of this little trail. It's a very pretty um, summary. So this is Tibetoceris depressa, which has a bunch of uh, synonyms. So you, it used to be in Crappies and Yangia and Soroceris, and uh, apparently is a separate species now, and it has a interesting head morphology, and is one of the high altitude members uh, of composite that grow in the Himalaya. So very cool uh, high altitude alpine plant. So this is another very cool, weird growth form. 
So this is uh, giant Coreopsis, the leptosine gigantia. Um, so Isaac gave a really long explanation here. So it's it has this tree habitat hab, habit. Uh, they grow in this little forest on the marine terraces. So probably on top of these big bluffs. Um, and every year the trunk grows uh, the leaves and this branch capitalizes with 50 to 200 heads on it. And according to Isaac, it makes everybody say, whoa, what a cl crazy plant. And yes, they're very, very interesting. I like that. I wish I could see them in person one day. Okay. Uh, it's funny how many submissions started to, with, it's too hard to pick just one. I can't choose. People have so many favorite composites. So this is Peritoli inoyensis. Uh, it's a rock daisy in the tribe Peritoli. Uh, and Maria Jesus uh, is saying that it was one of the few plants that greeted her with vibrant blooms during the heat of the summer when most other species are dormant. Uh, it's extremely restricted in range and it's threatened by mining, unfortunately. I hope uh, it stays safe from mining. It's a very cute little rock daisy. Okay, this is Dahlia campanulata, uh, which is a very interesting Dahlia. I really enjoyed this photo. Um, it's one of the most robust Dahlia species. They're with the largest heads. Uh, maybe that's why they have this nodding position. And it inhabited, inhabits the mega diverse region of Oaxaca in Mexico. It's a very cool plant. Thank you for sending it. Okay, this is a very pretty photo, uh, another alpine compositing. Uh, this is Hymenoxus grandiflora, uh, also known as Old Man of the Mountain. Uh, it is in the alpine tundra. Um, and I, well, uh, Jennifer likes them, them because it's very challenging to get to them. Uh, and she knows that summer is here, but almost gone at the same time because in high altitudes, summer lasts very little, very short. And she knows it's an indication that she needs to get moving and collect all the plants. They're very, very, very cool and very nice photo. This is uh, Mike Barker's submission. So this is Coriocarpus arizonica, arizonicus, uh, known as little lemon heads. Uh, that's very cute. Uh, it's not a common plant, but it thrives in, in hot and dry shade, which is a very curious uh, type of habitat. Um, and Mike says that these little yellow fluorescences have been there nearly every day of the pandemic. And I agree that gives a very special status to this plant. It's a very cool one. Thank you for sending that. Then we have a Grindelia, uh, which are commonly known as gum plants, but this is a non gummy gum plant. Uh, so it keeps the resin inside instead of secreting it. Secreting it. And there's a little, little moth hiding on it. Very cute. Uh, I really like this spiny uh, filaries. It's very cool. So this is Chukiraga juicier. Uh, so it's known as flower of the Andes and it's an evergreen shrub. It grows in very dry places in the mountains uh, and has this very beautiful showy orange flowers, uh, florets with the orange bracts and it's very spiny. <laughs> it's very hard to collect it and is in subfamily Barnardizioide. This is another Bernadizioide. This is Desiphilum ferox. 
And Louis said that he likes this plant because it always surprised him that this really belongs in Asteraceae. And yes, I've seen this plants of this genus in the field and it's always kind of weird, especially because sometimes there are trees. What's going on? They have spines. <laughs> Um, it's a very interesting genus um, from South America. So this is an echinops, uh, and Oriani says he li she likes it because it reminds her of the Provence, and it's such a pretty color. It almost looks like a painting, and amazing photo too. Uh, and this is a secondary head too, so it's a head of heads. Uh, also known as Cynthophalia sometimes. And uh, we have here Vernonia alamani, which is a very pretty Vernonia from Mexico. And uh, the color is so striking. I love this purple. And they are food for bees and monarch butterflies too, which is very cool. And it's also endemic to Mexico. Thank you for sending that. I really like it. And here we have Tajeris erecta. Uh, it's also known as Flor, Flor de Muerto in San Pasuchil. So I, I'm not gonna try to ruin this name. Uh, it's one of the most important plant species used in the Dia de, uh, de Muerto celebration in Mexico. It's been domesticated in Mesoamerica uh, and used as medicinal and decoration since pre-Columbian times. And is also very common in gardens around the world where it's known as marigold. A very nice photo really like it and i didn't know about the the cultural significance of this plant it's very very nice so this is Anforicarpus altariatus uh which is another mountain plant plant as i can assume uh it has a very interesting name in serbia and it is an enigmatic genus yes it looks very enigmatic I imagine that it's probably very hard to get to where they, they grow too. And Gustavo said that uh, his favorite species right now is Baccaris funky, which is funky, funky eye, uh, regard, depending on how you say that. Uh, it's this plant here because it's a very hardy species living on bare rock outcrops and it's named in honor of Vicky Funk. And uh, it's also, it, he published it himself along with other Uruguayan composite specialists. So there you go, Bakker is funky. And that's my own mission. So this is Cresta Marcy. It's one of my favorite species of compositi. Uh, it grows in the semi-arid region in Brazil, grows straight on rocks, has this crazy secondary heads that grow uh, indefinitely. And it's one of the few plants that goats don't eat, which is very interesting in that region. And it's, it, dry, it flowers well into the dry season when everything is dead and dying. So I really like it. And here we are. So it was very cool to see everybody's favorite composite. I really enjoyed looking through the submissions. Uh, thank you all for participating. Uh, yes, uh, so I, I'm looking at the chat now. So we're gonna put all these photos on Twitter. Uh, we're gonna make sure that we, we get um, uh, image descriptions before putting them on Twitter too. And I'll also make, a, if, uh, if everybody agrees, uh, I'm going to make a PDF of uh, this and put in the Compositive website or share by email. Um, if I, don't, I think most people that send me stuff is not here. So if you are here and you don't want your photo to be released publicly, please tell me and I'm not going to put it in there and I'm going to make sure that I ask everybody by email before doing that. Um, but yeah, it's going to be shared uh, more widely. Um, 
Yes, I agree that uh, we could make a little put a little more information in a booklet. That would be cool. Um, okay. Yes, and uh, Morgan is asking uh, if we could still send, please let you know. Yes, if you didn't send one and want to send one, please uh, send it to the TICA seminar uh, email. Uh, it's the email that sends you guys the, the announcements about the seminars. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, being in the seminars this year as much as I enjoyed, and uh, Jennifer and Isaac, who who are also in the organizing team also enjoyed it. Um, and, and if anybody wants to say something or want, and wants to ask something, uh, please. Yes, Jennifer. I'll just let you know that we are working on the second issue of Capitulum. It should be out at the end of this year. We have a bunch of great articles this time around. So look for an email from us. If you haven't joined um, Tika, so that we have your email address, you can go to the compositi.org website and do that. So we'll make sure that you get the newsletter. And then we'll also ask everyone to broadly share that around with their friends and colleagues and parents even. So um, <laughs> thanks and look forward to that. Yes, so I will contact everyone to send a photo by email uh, to ask about like country and tribe and other more information about the, the plants and if you agree to let it uh, be part of a booklet or of some sort. So wait for an email in the next few weeks. Uh, and I hope everybody has a great end of the year, end of the semester, and uh, I hope to see you all again next year in the next Tika Talks. Um, not exactly sure when the next one will be, but there will be a next one. Bye, everybody. Bye, thank you. Bye, thank you. Bye, everyone, thank you. Have a good holidays. Yes, Bye. happy holidays.